Hi, welcome back. So in this video, what we're going to do is if we place enemies in the scene on this navigation mesh, which allows the system to work out how enemies should navigate from A to B, then when we get within a predefined radius, three meters in this case, they will chase us and they will find their own way to us. And if we get outside of that uh, too long a distance from them, they will stop uh, chasing us. So just before we get into the nav mesh stuff, I'm running around in Rick's terrain here thinking, I was about to say it's pretty boring our game at the moment, but actually Rick's level is so <laughs> so interesting that you could, you could spend a little time running around in here before you felt that you had to have combat, but over in my combat sandbox, it really is dull right now. There's nothing going on. So that's one of my motivations for making the next thing we do um, have these enemies shoot at us. Why shoot them if they haven't already shot at us, eh? So rules of engagement and all that. But in Rick's level, uh, as a brief aside here, as you run around, you may notice in your level, particularly on our fences, things that have some transparency in them like this, you see what's happening. Can you see that the shadows, as I get closer and further away from this fence on my right here, are appearing and disappearing? I'm finding that very distracting as I move around the scene, personally. Really annoying, low-quality thing. So we're going to fix it real quick. What it is, is if you go to your project settings and quality, edit project settings quality, you will see under here that we have both hard and soft shadows at the moment. And the problem, I think, is that it's the swapping between soft and hard shadows. If we go to hard shadows only, you may want to just, in your game window, turn on stats to make sure your performance is still OK. But on most hardware, it should be. I'm still getting over 70 frames a second. So I'll turn that back off so we can see now that the problem is not entirely gone away, but we have hard shadows all the time. It is coming in and filling them in a little bit darker, but the, pro the problem is almost entirely gone. So that's the solution there. Just set hard shadows only. Obviously, make sure you're doing it when you are in stopped mode. If you do it in play mode, then it, you're just previewing those changes. All right, wicked. So that is that. Now let's talk about nav meshes and why we would care. I'm going to start over in my combat sandbox and what we need in order for these enemies to be able to navigate their way to us is something called pathfinding. Now, in your further reading, I have linked you to Wikipedia and on Wikipedia, it talks briefly about pathfinding. This is it in a nutshell. It is the question of if we want to get from A to B, in fact, this even looks like our level on Wikipedia. If we want to get from A to B, the computer's got to have some way of working out that path. It's basically solving a maze. Now, it's incredibly simple right now in this level, but you can imagine situations in which it would get complicated. In order to be able to do that, the system needs something called a nav mesh. Now, we have covered this over in the Complete Unity Developer, but I'm going to recap it here. If you click the window menu and you go down to Navigation, you'll get yourself a Navigation tab. And unless you've already added a nav mesh, you'll find that your scene does not currently have one. But once you go to the Navigation tab, you will get this blue outline like this over your world, and you will have the opportunity to bake your nav mesh. So you click Bake. All right, so then... To make sure that you're baking it to the right object, you click on your terrain in your scene. In fact, I'm going to just name my terrain terrain or ground, just so it's not the default. And you want to make sure that the terrain is navigation static for now. This is not changing from the standpoint of navigation. We're not getting into dynamic terrain at this point. All right. And that this entire navigation area is the walkable layer. So Static, walkable layer, don't worry about off-mesh links, it just doesn't matter. If you click Bake now, then seemingly very little will happen when you play your game. But what it does is it enables the nav mesh agents to move around. So we always do that first, okay? If you're wondering what that makes a change to, it just makes a change to an asset called the nav mesh inside the Combat Sandbox subfolder. Remember I told you before that the level below your .unity file, it will create a folder, and then in there you've got that nav mesh. Okay, cool. So as a challenge for you, this is not the main challenge of the video, but a mini challenge for you is that if you've got another scene in your in your game, what I want you to do is go and add a nav mesh to that now before you watch me do it for Rick's scene. All right, so this is Rick's scene right now. If we go to navigation, we have no nav mesh. We're showing nav mesh. We're on navigation. So we select the terrain. Same deal, same settings, and we click bake. Now, this might take a little bit longer because it's got some thinking to do right now. So... Let's just stand back and watch it do it. We need to be close enough to be able to see it. Something like this. 
ah, boom. That actually had quite a lot of thinking to do to be able to do that. Now, this nav mesh is not going to be perfect right now. In fact, you can see straight away that the enemies would not, for example, be able to chase us up this ramp right now because there's too much of a discontinuity right here. Now, I'll go and fix that for Rick just by lifting that up a little and rebaking. So one of the things you need to do when you've got a more complicated terrain is to make sure that it is sufficiently continuous that the nav mesh has got a chance of actually operating. Let's try again. Now this thing here, this slope is not currently selected as navigation static. So we need to make it navigation static in order that this town entry ramp one is gonna be included in the nav mesh. All right, now if that's not working, then you may need to play around with under the bake, navigation bake tab, maximum slope and things, but generally you'll find that once you've selected the object that you're not currently able to navigate over, like say one of these other ramps, you select it, you set it navigation static and you rebake, then you just need a little bit of time now. It's not really any affordance apart from perhaps something flashing down the bottom right that it's busy doing anything. There you go, it's found a nav mesh. Let's go again on the final ramp there. We bake that. And that is how you get a continuous navigation area. Now we're being very rough and loose, I think as uh, fast and loose, I think Rick calls it for now. All I'm doing is looking around the scene to make sure that all the places that I can get, like across this bridge, the AI can follow me. So I'll set that bridge, this bridge over here as well. Now I need to be close enough to not click on the game canvas. By the way, if you're having trouble clicking and, you're, and it's always hitting the game canvas like this, there is a way of preventing that from happening. You can turn off uh, under layers at the top right, turn off UI, and now it shouldn't, when you click around in your scene, accidentally hit your canvas. So there's a tip for you. Layers, turn off UI visibility for now. But remember to turn it back on later. So what I'm doing is I'm just looking for bridges that are not currently walkable layer um, and from a navigation standpoint, and I'm making sure that those items are on the walkable layer. Okay, and by doing that, the navigation system will find a mesh across them. It's quite messy, and we can tidy this up uh, later by per tweaking parameters, but right now it looks that most places are connected to most other places. That is awesome. Okay, so that is how you do that bit. That's how you add a nav mesh to your terrain. Now we need to think about adding a nav mesh agent to our enemy prefab. Now I'm gonna go into my combat sandbox for this just to start off somewhere simple. And I'm gonna come for the moment out of the navigation tab. And we're gonna think about how we make these dudes actually navigate. So I'm gonna pick a particular enemy for now. See if I can get one working. And then if I can get one instance of an enemy working, then I'll abstract that up to all of the enemies. So let's have this guy here ready to chase us. Right now he doesn't chase us. He's got no reason to, he's not being told to. There's nothing inside the enemy code at the moment that tells him to, he just has some basic health. So let's see how to do it. We click on the enemy and we need to add a new component. That new component is a nav mesh agent. So go find yourself the nav mesh agent component. I'm gonna move it up one. I don't like it being, I, well, I like the bottom most thing to be my, my custom behavior script. So I'm gonna move it up. It's saying it's gonna break the prefab instance. That's okay, but bear in mind now that this is a broken instance and that once we've got this enemy working right, we're gonna to wanna to drag him over the enemy prefab and uh, replace the enemy prefab. But for now, that's fine. Let's play the game, just see what happens. I'm getting absolutely nothing, which is not surprising because again, we have not yet coded any behavior and guess what? It's gonna be your job to code the behavior. But before we do that, the first thing we're gonna to want to do is add another component here, which is an AI character control script. Now that is in the standard assets folder and here it is. When I say in the standard assets folder, by the way, I mean that it's down in standard assets, third person character scripts. All right, in fact, given that we're gonna be using it, we may as well no, I'm gonna leave it where it is for now, actually, because we need to be a little bit careful of namespaces. Look, I'll show you what I mean. Inside here, this script is in something called a namespace, and that separates out different classes to make sure they don't conflict with one another. But we don't wanna mess around with the, with the path at the moment, because this path here determines where Unity goes to look for this script. So let's just focus on using this for the moment rather than tidying up. So this guy basically binds the nav mesh agent to the third person character. You can see that by the fact it requires both of those components and also that it has the nav mesh agent and the third person character here. It also has the idea of a target transform. Let's just see that in action. So here's the AI character control. Again, I'm gonna move that up one because I want my custom code at the very bottom probably being a control freak. So here's this enemy that we're trying to customize. He currently has no target transform. If I was to choose the player 
then he runs towards me and does crazy things like pushing me out the way. Okay, so that just shows that setting that target transform is what makes the enemy track whatever target we have set here. We could set something else, like we could play the game and we could grab, say, this cube from the scene view here and we could put that into the enemy's target transform if we wanted to. And let's just see that happen just for fun, just so we can see the, the idea. Let's select the correct enemy down to the target transform, grab, I don't know, this say this cube here, pop it in, and you see he navigates to the cube, all right? You get the idea, he goes to that target transform. So what we're gonna do is want to write the code, quite simply, not without changing this AI character control, let's write the code in enemy using the AI character control. By the way, it's here, it's in this namespace. So let me help you with that bit, actually. Let's say using that namespace at the top. So using, otherwise you won't be able to find what you need. Using that namespace, let's go and find privately the third person character, and we may as well just call it that. I'm gonna challenge you to finish this off, but I'm just gonna say it's null. Now what we're gonna do in the start is we're gonna go and find that third person character, and we're going to set the player as the transform if the player is within a certain radius that will specify as a parameter for this, okay? So let me show you your challenge. I'm gonna just update the bottom of the screen so that you know you're on your challenge, and then let's go over. So, enemies should rush the player. Use a simple radius for now. When the player comes too close, the enemies should chase the player. Enemies should stop just short of the enemy, uh, of the player rather, that should say player there. I'll fix that live. And finally, adjust the trigger radius, the stopping radius and the speed of the player. Let me just show you where those things are. The trigger radius will be a property you'll create on the enemy, a new property on the enemy script. The stopping distance is here on the nav mesh agent. And the final thing was the speed, the running speed. You probably wanna be playing with the third person characters, animation speed multiplier, maybe move speed multiplier. Okay, because with the settings I've got, I think it's gonna look a bit funny. But anyway, go ahead, see if you can do it. See if you can make the enemy script set the transform of the player when you get inside a certain distance. You'll also have to think about when the player isn't in a distance, where should the enemy be navigating to? So pause the video, have a go, see if you can do that challenge, and I'll see you in a minute. Hey, welcome back. All right, so I'm gonna just pop into the enemy script now. I'm gonna serialize a parameter which is going to be called attack radius. As I said later, we could do something more sophisticated than just a radius if we wanted to. We don't need it right now. All right, cool. So on start, we need to go and find ourselves the player. Now we've done this before using the game object static. So firstly, I need a place to hold the player. So I'm just gonna say player. Actually, I'm gonna say game object because it's gonna save us problems with trying to cast a game object to a player type. All we care about the player is a game object property called its transform. Gonna be honest that it starts as null like that. And then I'm gonna go and find the player and start as follows. Player equals game object, capital G, because it's a static method. Um, and I'm gonna type the word tag to help me find find game object. There's only one player with tag. And then it's not in curly braces because it takes a string and that string is player. Good. At this point, we should have a the player. Now, all we need to do is say on update something relatively simple. Oh, hang on, do I have the third person character? No, I need to do that as well. So I just need to say third person character, oops, equals um, get component, and it's gonna be of type third person character, which is also attached to the enemy, so that should work just fine. And that's that. So now we have the player and the third person character. Good. All right, so on update, what are we gonna do? Well, let's take a look. Relatively simple, I would say. I would say that we do it like this. We need to work out what the distance to the player is. So let's call it that float. Distance to player equals, now what does it equal? Because the players, actually there's a method on, there's a static on vector three called distance, which does the distance for you very easily. You just get two vectors, okay? Vector three dot distance with a capital D, and we want the distance from the player, or to the player, so it's player dot transform dot position, and the other vector is just the transform dot position of what we are, which is the enemy. Cool, so that should tell us the distance to the player. Now we just ask a simple question. If the distance to the player is less than or equal to the attack radius, then what are we gonna do? Well, now we need to talk to the 
AI agent, or the third person character rather. How do we know it's the third person character? No, we need the AI character control, actually. That's what we need. I've gone and got the wrong thing, but I'll leave this in. Instead of getting the third person character, which would be tempting, what I actually need is the AI character control. So let me see if that's available. Yes, it is. AI character control and AI character control. You may have wondered what on earth I was doing there. So it's the AI character control that I need to go and get. So let's just change that in here. Because what I want to be setting is this property in the AI character control, the transform. We're not talking direct to the third person character. All right, cool. So now the AI character control dot. Now, what do we have on here? Dot target. There you go. Or we probably have a method be better than that. Do we have a set target? Yes, we do. Set target. Now, what do we do if you are within the attack radius? Well, it's the player.transform. And if you are not within the attack radius, then we just tell him to go to his own position, i.e. nowhere. So we put an else in here. And we're going to just say the same thing. AI character control set target. Boom. And then just transform. Does that make sense, what we're doing here? We're just saying, if we're close enough, navigate to the player. Otherwise, navigate to ourselves. So let's take a look at how this works. I've got myself a few settings here. I've put an animation, a move speed multiplier of 0.5 and an animation speed multiplier of 1. And that leads to the enemy chasing me, which is just fine. I've also put a stopping distance of 1.5. Maybe I need a little bit more than that, maybe 2 meter stopping distance so that when the enemy gets to me, he doesn't start bumping into me. That is absolutely fine. The other thing you can do with your enemy if you want is you can make him kinematic so that the physics doesn't apply to him, which means that when I bump into him, he doesn't go getting pushed off into the distance. So kinematic, we have a animation speed multiplier of one, a move speed multiplier of 0.5, and that all seems to be working pretty well. Also a stopping distance of two meters, everything else I've left as default. So I'm liking this enemy, so I'm gonna apply him back to the prefab, and now each of these enemy instances can have their stopping distances set independently. So this dude up on here, I'm within his distance, he jumps straight off and rushes me. That's all good. And then Rick hasn't got, if I remember, any enemies in his scene yet, but he can now comfortably come into the game and add enemies all he likes and they will start rushing us. Let's just test that concept by dropping an enemy prefab at runtime, let's say, into the scene view. Just go find the player by double clicking. Drop an enemy, probably outside of radius like so. And then just go back to the play view and try and get within his radius. And yes, he runs. Now, if yours doesn't run, then that'll be because probably you haven't got a nav mesh. Remember to check that you actually have a nav mesh available. All right, fantastic. I will look forward to seeing you in the next video.